So welcome everybody to um, my session on uh, authentication and authorization for REST services. Um, I'm, a, I'm a software architect. Um, I've worked um, at the beginning of my career in the telecom industry. Um, I then became an independent uh, about uh, 15 years, over 15 years ago. I've done a lot of consultancy in various uh, sectors, in various uh, companies. Um, mainly lately as a, as a soft, as a security architect. Um, I'm also recently, I've also recently started doing fixed price projects. Um, and what I want to talk to you about today is mainly my experience uh, developing um, authentication and, and authorization solutions for REST services in the last, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, I'm one of the founders of SecUpDev. Um, you can find more on, of my bio, on my bio here, on my website, um, my Twitter account, and also uh, I'm presenting this off a, a Google Drive um, presentation. So if you would like to have access to that presentation, um, with the ability to give comments, please drop me a line on the email because um, uh, I'd love to have your feedback. I'd like, I'd love to have your comments. Um, you know, to me, uh, this is part of a, an ongoing conversation, and you know, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around uh, how to do authentication and authorization for REST services. Uh, I think as the session progresses, you'll understand that this is not a um, that this is not a solved problem. Uh, there are many things that um, need to um, be refined, um, not only in in the systems that I'm building, but I think in the community at large. Um, I think that there are many open questions that remain to be debated, and I'd, I'd love it if we could together. Um, try to converge to some um, some best practices, and, and in fact, th this is what I I would like this session um, to 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 achieve. I, I would like to um, to uh, present you with a number uh, a couple of things that I think uh, are architectural principles now. What do I mean by architectural principles? Um, uh, what, what do you think? What, uh, what could that mean, architectural principles? Jim? These are security design patterns that can be applicable to standardized situations. Right, right. Um, yeah, so um, you will have to check whether your situation corresponds to the situation that they are applicable to. But, you know, um, hopefully um, these are principles that you will find useful if, um, if you um, are uh, developing the kind, of, um, the kind of systems that I think are becoming more prevalent now um, and that correspond to um, the kind of um, um, architectures that, that I'll, be, I'll be presenting to you. Um, but, but please, um, you know, think with me, um, you know, intervene when, when I present these principles. Um, and I will also be talking about some of the enabling technologies uh, for these, these, um, these patterns. Uh, so we have OpenID Connect, uh, it's been mentioned already several times by, by Philippe and by Jim. Um, JOT, uh, which has also been mentioned by Philippe and, and Jim. And then I'd like to have a more speculative part. I call it here the wish list. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about um, why we want to move to um, proof of possession tokens. Um, now, proof of possession tokens have been standardized. But I haven't seen um, many uh, implementations of them. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any industrial strength 
implementations. Um, but I, I think as soon as they are there, I, I would certainly want to use them. Um, and then I'd like to talk to you about um, externalizing the policy decision point. So we'll spend quite a bit of time on, um, on the idea of externalizing the identity provider. Now, for the same kind of reasons, I think you also want to externalize the policy decision point. And, and Martin, um, for those of you who went to Martin de Katt's session on access control, talked about that uh, as, a, as a very powerful, um, as, as a very powerful separation of concerns uh, uh, pattern. Uh, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to do it today. Um, I think that uh, Yuma is, uh, is a promising technology in that context, but um, I, I haven't tried it myself. Um, if if uh, any of you have any experience on, on that, then I would uh, certainly welcome um, your input um, and your thoughts. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, when we, we talk about uh, REST, uh, what, what are the consumers, what are the REST API consumers? Um, well, we've got web applications, uh, but we have also got uh, SPAs, single page applications, and very similarly, mobile apps. Um, and in fact, I will be, my slides often have SPA in them, but whenever you see SPA, you can substitute that with mobile apps as well, uh, because I think that you know functionally they they, they are very similar. Um, Jim, you you look uh, troubled. I, 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 I disagree because the architecture for the various OAuth workflows that we depend upon are radically different for OAuth versus mobile. Because mobile is going to have a redirect from the mobile client to web, web back to mobile client to to. Uh, handle the basic risk of the mobile platform where spas are usually doing direct <coughs> implicit like flows. So I mean they're, they're similar but but there's the, the, as a programmer the technology that I need to code to handle those two workflows are going to be significantly different. I, I would say this though. I would say that that mobile apps and native apps are identical authentication and access control architectures. Web applications have their own world and spas are ill-defined how, how they interact with these technologies. That's that, that's my that's my subjective take on this. Okay. Okay. Well. Well. Let's let's um, come back to that point when we when when we look at some of some configurations where we're showing um, SPAs, and then we can check whether these considerations also apply to to mobile apps. I'm ready to have my mind changed. <laughs> okay. Then then uh, there are other REST services. Um, but so the, the main message here is that we are in a, uh, uh, in, in a new paradigm, or we're moving into a new paradigm, uh, which by many is, is hyped as the API economy. Um, so um, the, uh, the days of um, REST services being developed purely for the consumption of a single web application um, are, are um, numbered. Um, but nonetheless, let's let's start with uh, with that. So, who um, who has developed uh, an architecture that looked like this? Okay. Okay. So, so you see what's going on. You've got you've got uh, the user agent. You've got the browser, um, and that's uh, going to a web application. The web application does authentication. And um, it's, the web application is then in charge of the authorization um, before it, it accesses resources, right? Is it fair to say that this is a fairly traditional um, way of working and one that, that has been deployed um, very frequently? This is how REST started, because we would take all of our legacy um, incompatible system, slap an insecure REST interface in front, in front of it, and now we can talk to it in a standardized fashion. This is a major security anti-pattern the way it's mostly deployed, but it's how REST got started. It's a good okay. Slide. Okay. 
Um, so, so, but what is the anti pattern? I, I'm the anti -pattern wondering. The anti pattern is most folks will drop, well, most folks will deploy this kind of REST service within a trusted application network, skip authentication, skip authorization, and treat this threat service like a dumb data pipe, right? And that, that's okay in certain architectures, but then suddenly everyone else needs to use it and security falls down. So, so that's the anti pattern. Using this REST service like it's a dumb data pipe without your proper security controls at the REST API level. I see, you'd like to have security controls at the REST API level. Yeah, to have security controls at the REST API level. Okay, so, 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 so why do you need? Uh, um, it started like, exactly like Jim, you know, some legacy application that has been over like 50 years. And it's okay. a way to consume it from new development. But we really personally the security, the authorization, it's done or it's, yeah, that's, it's copied. Okay, so, so you reject this, this kind of pattern. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Right. So... so uh, so... So, so the little the little guy here, the little smiley, is responsible for authentication, right? Um, and so the the uh, I suppose don't the interdiction uh, the the don't do sign is uh, authorization. Okay. This is a radically dangerous anti pattern with no good usage anywhere for anyone, and it is, it's profane and irreverent. Okay, okay. And, and why? Can you, can you remind us why? Because I will get into your network, and in a trivial fashion, I completely I'm, own everything. I, hang, hang on, hang on. The networks get compromised, and it's game over. That's the problem with this. Okay, well, so, so here we've taken care of putting a trust boundary around here, there are no around this. That, that those trust boundaries get broken, I get into your network, and then it's game over. That's the problem. Well, there are no trust boundaries. I, I sympathize, but I, I, I'm not sure that I, that I agree. I mean, you know, the data center um, has trusted zones, typically, um, and it seems that a number of companies can do a reasonably good job at, uh, at, at putting up solid uh, network security controls. I don't agree with that at all. No? No? Way. No. no? I don't trust it. That's true, that's true. That's true, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm in trouble here because I've got many of these, these trust zones uh, in, uh, in, in my slides. Um, but, you know, okay, let's, let's uh, revisit them as they, as they flash up and uh, let's see whether, uh, w whether they, they could do something useful or whether we need additional, additional defenses, okay? Um, but so, so we don't like this, right? So we don't like this because of the, 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 the insecurity of the network controls. That's one reason. But are there any other reasons why we don't like this? Well, your main, your main data source and transactional <coughs> source is wide open to, to any user. And when you, you, even though you place it in a trust zone today, you're going to need to expand usage of that REST service over time. It happens to everyone. So maybe yeah. your web app to REST service is a trust zone, but look at that third-party web app. That's out of the trust zone. Yeah, you, you mean this, this one here? Yeah. Uh, hang on. Oh, damn. Uh, where's this? So you mean this one here? Yeah, that's the, you, you, that's the one that you call the third-party yeah, web no, app. You have no way to let third parties talk to your core REST service in a standard secure fashion. So, so you have to expose your web service outside the, the trust zone? Well, y yes and no. I mean, what, what you could do here is you could make sure that he only listens to any traffic coming from, from here, right? Um, so you, you, you punch a privileged hole through your... N no? Those no, you don't control. like that? Those, you those don't like that? Those based controls are weak. You want real application <coughs> authentication and authorization. If you're okay. going to punch a hole and let someone through the network talk to that REST service, 
I can do IP spoofing and send a tax in, and, it's, I'm, and I'm five minutes into my pen test, and you're burning, burning. Okay, okay. So we're in trouble here. Yes. Um, uh, any other reasons why this might not be such a good idea? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So we don't know rules for trigger that application? What, what is what? How to trust this application? And what's the other example? You mean the REST service cannot make the distinction between this web application and this web application? Yeah, probably not, no. Yeah. Um, But and yeah, okay, so, so then you, you're talking about authenticating the the yeah, consumer. The, the, consumer yeah. the the consumer of the of, of the API. Okay. Okay, we will talk about that right at the end of the um, uh, of, of the presentation. Um, but that's a good point. That's a good point. Okay. Let's see whether we can do better. Um, how about this? So now I've got authorization on the on the REST service. But this is nonsense, though, because author, access control requires authentication. But I've got authentication. Well, no, 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 not quite, not quite. Uh, I'm, I'm you're passing. Decoupling, you're decoupling them dramatically, is what you're doing here. That's true. That's true. That's a path to do this. Yes. Open ID connected, right? Yes. Open ID connected, the same, right? Decouple authentication. Yeah, open ID connect is horrible. <laughs> okay, yeah, we, we, we're not on a mission to, to defend open ID connect. So if you, if you feel that that's an anti pattern, okay, fair enough. We'll, we'll, we'll have difficulties finding a. I rewind away from that. All I'm saying is at the REST level, I'd like to see both authentication and authorization. That's all. Or at least some kind of a boundary check at that level. This implies that I can start talking to your REST service without any kind of authentication. No, no, that, that, that's not true. Um, I, I, maybe it's not clear I'm enough. There are, the, there are these identity claims that are being passed. Uh, so that their identity claims, they're being passed to the REST service. And it's based on these identity claims that the REST service will then do the authorization. So is there an auth end gate at the REST service level? Does that require that I'm properly authenticated to talk to your REST service? Uh, well, yes, presumably a, a correctly implemented authorization <laughs> um, gate would, would check whether you know, these identity claims are in fact there. If they're not, then, then it doesn't have anything to base it. Can I start making REST calls without any kind of authentication? If the answer is no. The, the okay, the answer is no. The answer is no uh, because you need these, these identity claims. And how we're going to, to make these verifiable, et cetera, is something that, that I want to postpone for now. But I would put your auth end bubble at the REST service level to, to illustrate that point. Because what, the way this is illustrated. Okay, okay, that, that, that's a good point because. I mean, as many of these terms, uh, authentication is uh, a term that is much overloaded. So some people talk about authentication um, as um, a, an interaction between the end user and uh, a, a service that verifies credentials, right? Um, some other people say, well, you know, validating whether a security token um, well, validating a security token is in and of itself also authentication, yeah. right? At least um, so, 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 okay, in that sense, you can consider, in the latter sense, you can consider to be um, an authentication present there, right? Because clearly 
if you're going to be relying on these identity claims, then you have to be sure that these identity claims are authentic, that, that they um, have been made by a trusted party. Okay. Okay, any other comments? Let's move on. Um, so, yeah, in, in the context of single page applications, what, what, what does this become? Um, so you don't have a web app anymore. Um, uh, we, we're in a context where we are decoupling the uh, single page application from the REST service. The vision of the API economy is that the uh, APIs are implemented by one party and then they are consumed by many others. Um, you know, third parties, um, all uh, develop clients for the, uh, the REST APIs, um, consumers for the REST APIs. Um, so how, how are we going to handle this? Um, and is it true that single page applications are similar to mobile applications in this respect? So would you try to assume the communication will escape the device or the user met the application? Good question. Um, we'll come to that distinction later, but let's assume for now that it's the user that is being authenticated. So does this seem reasonable? You've got a situation where, as a company, you want to um, provide feeds uh, for something. Uh, for example, you want to, you want to um, uh, push out data about the weather. Um, and you are doing this um, to anyone who cares to um, pay for these data, for example. Uh, and it's other parties that are resp responsible for um, writing clients uh, that an end user can interact with. Could this work? Then you have no control on the authorization on the part which is outside of your platform. So I guess the authorization is provided by the application to a user. Also being managed by So what this diagram is saying is that the, the authentication and the authorization is, 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 is the responsibility of the REST service itself. So it writes somebody, you need to get credentials of identification, you need something in order to do it. So right, in yes, this yes. In this case, it's not clear on how it's populated. Right, right. Okay, good point. So, so yes, but th th this is in fact an implication of, of what we're drawing here. This guy here needs to know about all the users, right? Uh, not, it not only needs to know about the users, it also basically have, has to be able to check their credentials. Yeah, so probably if this is a, uh, if this is a REST service that is working at any scale, it's backed with a DB, with a database. If we say that authentication, your red circle, is identity establishment rather than full authentication, then this is a very common kind of architecture we'll see within one organization. When we need to federate and have multiple organizations involved in this, this will break down. But for one organization, this is perfectly, this is, this is what we have to do for good security Otherwise, I'm going to have direct access to your REST service without these controls, which is what has led to many breaches in the last couple of years. So again, if we redefine your red circles as identity establishment, this is a necessary kind of architecture, mm -hmm. I would dare say. Yeah. But, but identity establishment, what do you mean by that? Um, do you establish the identity by merely trusting the user to, to fill in his correct name, his correct identifier, or are you going to verify something? I mean, at the verification, right? 
there may be a, 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 a relationship between the REST service and your identity provider where they've established a trust relationship. So even though you might not be logging into the REST service, you're verifying that authentication was done properly. All I'm trying to say is a REST service that's not checking for any kind of authentication is always going to be a, an anti-pattern in an insecure program. I, I think I'm going too slow for you, Jim. You, you're jumping ahead uh, I, and I <laughs> make, making assumptions about how we're going to. But yes, I mean, this, this obviously is going to lead to an identity provider. OK. So um, yeah, um, question for you. If, if you take this pattern, how, how would you solve the problem of um, having several REST services that, that are being called by a single APA or, uh, sorry, a single SPA, or you have uh, a set of SPAs calling a set of, uh, of REST services? How, how, does that, how does that pan out? Would you get something like, like this, perhaps? Sorry? Take out the authentication authorization and build a single microservice. Yeah, centralized. And if it's the same trusted group, you have a centralized process. Right, right. OK. So this, this is the kind of thing that you mean, right? Uh, no? No, because there is a fundamental difference between this one and the previous one. OK. In the previous one, the REST service will make no assumption on where they reside. Right, right, okay. No, they made the assumption okay. that they have the same trust. Yes, absolutely. So you have to test and say, but these are data centers all over the world. Yes, so yes. Yes. No. Um, well, well, I could, and then I could say, well, and you may have many of these. <laughs> right. <laughs> are you okay with that? No, no, no I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but so 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 yes, but I, I think that the that that the main message here is um, it's a good idea to it's probably not a good idea to have every single REST service doing authentication and authorization. You want to you want to push as much of that as possible to um, to, to to a common component. Yeah, Jim. Establishment from authentication verification, even though each REST service may not do identity establishment, every single REST service must do okay, authentication fair enough. verification. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fair enough. So, yeah, here is a question about, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure who who asked that about uh, uh, who we are exactly authenticating? Is it the user, is it the, is it the client? Um, so for now, we're going to be um, mainly talking about the, the, the user. Um, so one way that the user could be authenticated uh, with this API gateway uh, could be authenticated by the API gateway is by, by sending the credentials. But there, there, are, there, there may be problems with this. So, so can you see some of the, the pros and cons of sending the credentials to, to the API gateway? So, the advantage of doing it that way is that it's, it's very simple, right? But the, the disadvantages are that now um, you, you have the ability for the client to completely impersonate the user, right? And uh, in fact, if the, if the uh, client does something entirely different from what the user is expecting, then, then he still will get away with it because it has those credentials uh, of, of the client. Um, basically, you've told the client to impersonate the user. Um, 
And you also have the problem that the, you have a very tight coupling between identity management and the API gateway. Now, this is a pattern that you see um, very often. I, I would say that most of the API gateways currently in use um, have this very tight coupling, i.e. They, they actually do, um, do user management in the API gateway. It's, it's, it's a plugin of the API gateway, it's, it's a basic feature of the API gateway, whatever. Um, but you know, they, they tend to be tightly coupled. I, I think that that is, a, that that is an anti-pattern. Um, and so what I would <coughs> urge you to consider is uh, to externalize the, um, the identity provider. Uh, so that's where you're going to be doing user management on the one hand, but also um, authentication. Um, so authentication in the sense of interaction uh, with the user, uh, checking the user credentials. Uh, I think that the, the appropriate place to do that is in a specialized um, identity provider, um, at least in... Um, in systems that um, have any kind of scale where, um, uh, you know, if, you, if you're building a very simple system, then by all means leave the user management in the API gateway. But, you know, if you, if you start to scale it up, uh, yeah, Mireille? If you can externalize these two, because those products are made to do that. Right. Take, take the risk. Well, I mean, vendors of uh, API gateways will tend to push you in the direction of uh, yeah, this pattern, right? Yeah. That's why they are done. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, when I say vendors, to be fair, um, many open source API gateways will, do, will, will use the same pattern, right? Um, and it's only when you uh, when you put sufficient effort in that, you know, you can persuade them to work in this pattern as well. Sorry? It's the case of um, the service API management from um, the very new ISS. AWS? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, so um, AWS has, has an identity provider, but as far as I can tell, um, that identity provider is really to manage the users of your um, AWS account. Um, you will have difficulties, I think, if you're trying to put the users of your system in that, uh, in, in that identity provider. I, I don't think that, uh, that that's what it's meant for. It's supposed to go there. Yes. <laughs> the best solution, but we will start in that direction, but we will consume mostly and provide mostly users with all incidents to the authentication service. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm currently building a system where... Um, that is being hosted on AWS. Um, I have looked at the AWS identity provider and really it, it doesn't seem to be suitable. So we're going to have um, a, a separate identity provider hosted on AWS, but separate from AWS uh, doing for, for user management and, um, and end user authentication. Okay, um, so let me just go into a couple of details uh, on this slide. So the idea here is that, um, uh, yeah, I, I, let, let me go through the various steps. So the first step 
uh, and this is not new, is that the user agent loads the SPA. The SPA then realizes that the user isn't logged in, so it, um, it redirects the SPA to the identity provider, um, and the identity provider is going to ask for the credentials. Um, is that right? Uh, yeah, yes. that's the credentials. It's going to ask for the credentials. The user sends the credentials, and the identity provider then returns the uh, returns a security token. Um, and um, this security token is checked by the SPA. The uh, SPA trusts, maybe I should have drawn the, the, the arrow like that actually, but so the SPA by now is running in the browser um, or in the mobile app. Um, it, uh, it trusts the identity provider and it validates that token, right? Um, <clears throat> When it has validated the token, it, it can customize its, uh, its UI to that specific user. So that's, that's uh, a first use of that, uh, that security code token. Um, and it can forward the token to the API gateway, um, which in turn will validate it um, and it will do so um, in the context of its trust relationship with the identity provider. Okay. That, that part's key, right? Are we going back to the identity provider every time, which is inefficient, or is there a, a pre-established trust relationship between your REST services and the identity provider? The, there must be a pre, uh, pre-existing uh, trust relationship, yes, yes. I mean, if, if, if there wasn't, uh, I don't quite see how you would, how you would organize that. Well, o o older mechanisms which have you go back and re-verify the token with the IDP every request. Oh, right, yes, okay. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a very good point. That's a very important point. You, indeed, you do not want to, um, to add an extra round trip when you get here um, back to the identity provider for efficiency reasons. Could you, maybe, I don't know, but you could, could you elaborate a bit on the security token? Does it go that the UI should be customized so I get that some characteristics of the user's application from the identity provider? And also, if it's, it's not ever a check each time with the identity, provi the identity provider, there should be something in the security token that shows it's a legitimate security token from the identity provider. Right. Uh, that's two different questions, I think. So, so, so the first question, it, it was indeed premature uh, of me to, to, to mention uh, customization because I haven't told you that you, you, you will have, you, you probably will have identity claims in that security token. We'll come to that, but that, that's, the, that, that's the bottom line. Um, then, um, what was the second one uh, about? So if you don't, if you have a legitimate security token, Ba yeah, basically it's signed. Yeah, we will go into detail about that as well. But that's that's the secret. Yeah, you, the the identity provider signs. Yeah. So yeah, the, the the identity provider will be signing the tokens that it uh, that uh, it issues. So. Um, Going, going further on that pattern um, of externalizing IDPs, um, you can do funky things, uh, and uh, uh, Jim has talked about this uh, somewhat already. Um, you can have an identity provider that relies on other identity providers. Um, and I, I'd like to make the distinction here between a federated identity provider and a brokered identity provider. Um, and I hope that you won't be bored 
with me explaining to you what the difference is. Um, so the difference is that, that in the case of federation, what's happening is that your credentials are traveling through the well-known identity, the, the, the identity provider that the SBA addresses first to the federated identity provider that then provides claims and those claims, identity claims, and those claims are turned into, an, uh, into a security token by your identity provider. Yeah. So think LDAP here, for example, um, Active Directory, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's this use case. The other one is uh, brokered I IDP, and that's much more uh, that's a pattern that is much more common on, uh, with, with social login, the so-called social login. Um, so there, you, uh, what's going to happen is that the identity provider is going to redirect, well, redirect, um, it's relative. So, so often, uh, the identity provider is going to allow the the user to make a choice how he or she wants to log in, right? Or maybe this is a choice that is being made already on the S SPA. Um, but in any case, the identity provider needs to give a redirection URL to the brokered IDP um, when the, the user um, goes to the brokered IDP and submits their credentials. Um, so in return, the brokered IDP, so think Facebook, think Google, um, will return a, an authorization code. The authorization code will then be passed to the identity provider um, In the, in the redirection URL, um, which will then contact the brokered IDP with the authorization code. It will get a uh, security token in return. Um, and then what happens is, is, although the next step is that a security token is passed to the S SBA, it's not the same security token as the one that it got from Google or Facebook. It's, it's uh, the, the security token here, at number seven, is checked by the identity provider um, and then turned into its own format, in, into its own um, uh, security token. So, so in other words, this one is signed by Google this one is signed by our own identity provider. I hope that that makes sense. It, it sounded pretty boring. Okay. You're just abstracting multiple federated entity providers behind your own exactly. identity provider. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so indeed, basically, this identity provider, the you, you, your um, uh, primary identity provider can delegate um, delegate the uh, authentication user management and authentication to to other um, identity providers, and it can do so in in two ways, either by brokering or by by federation. Okay, so so what I've just described to you, in fact, is. Uh, the authorization code flow of uh, OpenID Connect. Um, so I, I, I think this may be a good opportunity to, to dive into OpenID Connect a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go into the gory details, but I think it's good that you understand the basics. Um, and I think that this diagram from the standard is, uh, is, is, is key to um, understanding OpenID Connect. So what, what, what it says is that conceptually, um, a relying party 
Um, sends an authentication request to an open ID provider. So that's what we, that's the entity that we called identity provider previously. And this open ID provider is going to set up authentication and authorization with the end user. When that's finished, it can send the authentication response back to the relying party and as far as I'm concerned, you can ignore these two here. Um, so, so this is what, what happens conceptually. Um, the relying party um, is, a, is a generalization of um, client and backend. Uh, basically, anyone who is relying on tokens from the, uh, that, that are issued by the uh, OpenID uh, provider. Um, but so in our previous flow, um, the relying party would be the SPA. Or well, this would be a SPA. Uh, this would be a relying party. The uh, API gateway would be another relying party. Anyone that, that, um, that needs to validate the token. Um, so it's, it's conceptual in the sense that um, in many scenarios, the relying party does not directly communicate with the open ID provider. Um, but this happens uh, in, in, um, in various ways. Um, and they, open ID connect, in fact, defines three flows. Uh, so the one that we, oh, yeah, maybe before I get, get onto the flows, let me uh, explain uh, a couple more things about OpenID Connect. Uh, so this is, a, this is a protocol that is implemented on top of OAuth, um, which is something that, that puzzled me for, um, for quite a long time because it seemed to be the wrong way around to me, right? So you have an authentication protocol that is built on top of an authorization protocol. Uh, so I always thought that authorization comes after authentication, right? You need to know who you're dealing with before you can say, before you can decide what this person, this entity is allowed to do. Um, and so in OpenID Connect, they, they've done it like in, in the opposite way. Um, so the way it started to make sense to me is that um, um, OpenID Connect actually considers identity claims as resources. So what OpenID Connect is basically doing is it is asking the user whether he or she is okay with showing information about their identity, right? So the identity is a resource and you, you have to get access to that resource. Um, so as a result, what you get um, is, uh, as a result of OpenID Connect, you get uh, single sign-on uh, across a number of APIs, uh, any APIs that, that trust uh, your uh, identity provider um, will accept the tokens that are being issued by the, um, uh, by the identity provider. Um, and um, it does so in three distinct flows. So let's get down to those. Um, we've, we've covered the authorization code flow. Um, that's the dance that I showed you between the identity provider and the brokered identity provider. Um, what I should point out in addition is that um, what the client, so our SPA in uh, the, the previous diagram, receives is 
two tokens, in fact, an ID token and an access token. Um, and in the, implicit token, uh, in the implicit flow, this is the same. You, um, or rather, you, you always get an ID token back and you may get an access token back, uh, depending on what, what you request. But so the, 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 the major difference between authorization code flow and implicit flow is that in the case of the authorization code flow, guess what? You get an authorization code. And it's uh, only in, the, in, in a subsequent step that you uh, trade that authorization code for an access token. Yeah. Um, the implicit flow is actually recommended for um, clients implemented in a browser using a scripting language. Okay, um, this is this is what the standard says. Um, Can I clarify that a little bit, though? Yeah. For Open ID Connect identity verification, the implicit flow is an acceptable process. Okay. Using the implicit flow for delegation in Open ID Connect. And, 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 sorry, using the implicit flow for delegation with with OAuth two is extremely discouraged. So the only good use of implicit is going to be with o Open ID Connect. And the hallmark of this flow is that the token will be in a the token will be in a in a, um in a URL fragment after the hash. So it's no longer readable by the client, but the yeah. client can operate on it. That's implicit. Well, we'll see that we'll be getting those tokens back in the body, actually. That's not implicit flow, then. The, the implicit flow per the standard puts the token in a hash. I see. Okay. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So now URL where I can't read it. I can extract it from the URL, but I can operate on it. That's the original okay. implicit part. Yeah. And I yeah. did in my notes to figure this out, too, so I'm, it's complex. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, so uh, the standard explicitly says to, to use the implicit flow in uh, the SPA use case. Um, this, is, this is a literal quote. Um, but the, the OpenID Connect standard says that. Um, but in fact, you are using um, the OpenID Connect flow to not only get an ID token, but not only an ID token, but also an access token. So, so you are effectively doing the de delegation there as well. And, and this, this, again, this is, I, I showed you some research. This is debatable, where, where several companies will say, we would never do this because of the exposure of tokens to clients, which we can't control where other big providers like Google do exactly this, because they have a dozen PhDs to throw at this and lock down their tokens a bit more than most. But just, I just want to state, this is, a, this is known to be an extremely dangerous flow because we're exposing tokens. Well, to say the least, it's controversial. Fair, fair, um, fair enough. Uh, so so be, be careful, indeed. Um, personally, I'm, I'm currently going with the implicit flow. Um, I may regret it, uh, but um, um, I, to, to me, that seems to be the best trade-off between um, effort and performance on the one hand and uh, uh, security on, on the other. And so um, remember that the authorization code flow was, was fairly complex um, in the my recommendation is this is okay for identity establishment while it's a, a rather poor choice for delegation establishment. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that indeed you need uh, a number of mitigating um, factors if you do use the implicit flow. So, for example, I would recommend not to use refresh tokens. Um, uh, I would recommend to um, only use access tokens once. Uh, so basically, you don't have to store them. Um, 
but I think if you do that, then, then it can be a very reasonable choice. How does that work? You ask for another token. And then for any request to do it to a rest token, you also can work for the yes. for redirecting. Well, and, and it depends. It depends, of course. Somebody has to do the session management here. Ah, but this this is that that's another issue, yeah. um, because you could be getting many tokens on a single session. And maybe we can go into, into this uh, when I do a little demo. Um, so what happens is that the, the, the client, uh, the API consumer, is setting up a session with the IDP that is a classical uh, web application session, because the IDP in the end is just a web app. Um, so it, it sets up a, a session, and on that session, it can continue to get access tokens. Yeah. And, and if I may, we, I think we have to proceed with caution here. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if you're going to have short-lived one-time use tokens, and you want to keep fetching new access tokens, you're going to have to re-authenticate the user for each token or no. support the refresh token standard? No, 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 no. Th this is, this is the, the issue that, that Merlin uh, was asking about, I think. No, since you have a session, as, as soon as you have uh, authenticated with the IDP, as soon as the user has authenticated with the IDP, there is a session between the IDP and the, and the client. Um, and, yeah. and that session remains open until the client logs out or the session times out or you know, the, the usual mechanisms of, uh, uh, that you have in sessions. And so on that session, you can keep asking access tokens without the user having to, to re-authenticate. But is it, is it then a, a server-side session on the IDP or you do a client-side session, which would be an access token all the way anyway? I mean, if you store the session at the client side, you would yeah. work with the token and what, what's the difference with using it, an access token for Google? In this flow, you're logged into Google to start the flow. Then you redirect to like Atlassian and get a free ride. You're still logged into Google. Even though your Atlassian tokens get one use, you still maintain a dual session to both your IDP and your RP. So and then, why, what is the difference with storing the Atlassian, session yourself, uh, the Atlassian token yourself for a longer time? I mean, what is the Google token itself will has the same security issues because if you have the Google token, you can get another access token anyway. Well, a session token is um, it should be protected from from any um, uh, XSS attacks. Through the access token too. Um, you'd have to you'd have to build that yourself. Um, I guess so, yeah, yeah. But I mean, our application needs to affect, oh no, that's not true. That, that's the whole point of this, is that we, if we're gonna build it ourselves, we're gonna struggle. So exactly. Just, for a startup, hey, I'm just gonna use Google, Facebook, Twitter, my IDPs, those are relatively tested, and they're gonna do a better job than I can out the gate. But if I'm a bank, there's no way I'm gonna do this, I'll invest in it myself. But if I'm a startup or some, loosey-goosey social media, I'm probably better off using what's out there already. Depends on your threat model here. Yeah. You won't believe it, but my employer actually uh, uh, allowed to do a Facebook authentication on the space where you can try to see your own salary and stuff. I, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't killed him yet. Not my code. Not my code. Is, is this echoing what you're, what you're trying to say as well? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's an important message that, um, you know, if you're building um, security-sensitive um, components, then um, you, you have to carefully think about the buy or build decision. Um, I mean, sure, if, you're, if you have very specific requirements, if you are in a very high security um, environment where you can afford to spend lots of time and money on it, 
then it may be better to um, do absolutely the best job you possibly can and maybe deviate from, from the standards um, where they fall down. But if you, if you have limited means, then you tend to be better off with, uh, um, with components that are being provided by, by reputable um, companies, developers. Okay, so that was the implicit flow. There is the, a weird one, which is the, the hybrid flow. And, and in fact, it, it looks uh, exactly like the uh, authorization code flow, except for one thing, and that's the, the, the fifth step here. Um, and in the fifth step, it says that uh, the authorization server sends the end user back to the client with an authorization code. And then in the authorization code, that's the end of it. There is a full stop there. But here in the hybrid flow, it goes on to say, and depending on the response type, one or more additional parameters. Now, what are these one or more additional parameters? Um, it turns out that they are, in fact, the ID token and the access token. So basically, um, the hybrid flow is finished there, if you feel like it. Um, or you can make it behave like the authorization code flow. You can, you, you can use it in an implicit flow mode, and you can use it in an authorization um, code flow. I, I'm, I'm not clear why this is useful. It seems like you know, the option for people who want to hedge their bets, you know, who say, well, we want to configure it um, to use the hybrid flow so that we can have our clients uh, decide on the hoof what, uh, what they'll be doing. Okay, any, any questions uh, about, about OpenID Connect? So this, this covers most things that I wanted to say about OpenID Connect. So unless um, you have any more questions about that, I'll, I'll move on to the the tokens. So let's have a closer look, more detailed look um, at the tokens that we're getting back. So as I said, you, you have, you're getting a, an ID token and an access token. Um, the ID token is, is defined by OpenID Connect, whereas the access token is actually an OO2 token. Um, they're both bearer tokens. Um, I think that, Jim, was it you that talked about bearer tokens? Yes, you, you talked about. Uh, uh, but you talked about their, their, their um, technical characteristics too, right? Yes, they, they provide, they provide uh, establishment of identity or access independent of any other checks. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the ID tokens are standardized, whereas the access tokens are not standardized. Uh, or 2 doesn't standardize the, the format of the uh, of their to tokens, uh, whereas uh, ID, uh, OpenID Connect does. And it says that the token has to be a JOT, uh, and it goes into more detail. It, it, it also says um, uh, how they have to be signed um, and uh, uh, what claims they have to contain. Um, or 2 says that they are usually opaque to the client. But I'd like to dwell on that a little bit. Um, OAuth 2 is, is, is terribly ambiguous about this. Um, and I think that this is an important point. Um, this is from RFC 6749. So that's you know, the basic 
002 specification, um, the fundamental 002 specification. Um, and it's right from, I don't know, the first or the second page. Um, it, it says, not in the same paragraph, but in subsequent paragraphs, on the one hand, about the token that it is usually opaque to the client. And then in the next paragraph, it says it may self-contain the authorization information. So to me, these two things are, are contradictory. So um, opaque means that it doesn't have any meaningful information. Self-contained means that it does. Um, so what you're seeing is that implementations do either or both. Uh, so you have some implementations that um, use opaque tokens. To, you have implementations that, that use um, self-contained tokens. Um, and um, yeah, this is, this is a little overview that I um, made of tokens. Um, so you have on the one hand self-contained tokens and on the other uh, op opaque. Often they're also referred to as reference tokens because since the client cannot understand them, they have to refer to, um, to someone who will decipher them for, uh, for them. So they have to uh, send them back basically to the issuer and say, you know, what does this token mean? Um, so you have this, the, the, that distinction, the distinction between self-contained and opaque tokens. And then on the other hand, you have the distinction between bearer tokens. So bearer tokens are tokens that um, anyone that, that can produce it is supposed to be the legitimate user of that token, right? Um, whereas on the other hand, holder of key, which, which incidentally is a, is a synonym for proof of possession. Um, so holder of key tokens, uh, they tie the token to the... Um, to the presenting party, to the, the entity that is, is sending the token, right? Um, so the situation um, currently is that um, that all auth tokens could be here, um, but they could be here too. Um, and in fact, my recommendation to you, if you building uh, an application with OAuth, that you would look out for using JOTS because if you, um, if you use a reference token, then you're always going to have that extra round trip to verify. Um, so it's, it's a, a, a performance gain if you can, if you can verify the... Uh, the token um, in, the, in, in the relying party. Um, so OpenID Connect is there. Um, but it also allows you to um, use uh, holder of key or, or proof of possession uh, JOT tokens. JOT has, has uh, standardized proof of possession but I see very uh, few implementations. In fact, I, I don't know of any industrial strength implementations that, uh, that use uh, proof of possession tokens. So um, yeah, before, before we leave this slide, um, the argument that is often advanced to use reference tokens is that you can revoke them. Um, since you always have to check the token, you, you have to represent the token to the, the issuer at validation time. Um, some people argue that it, this is an advantage since you can then um, say, well, that token isn't valid after all. Uh, we, we've, uh, uh, we've had an incident in the meantime and uh, we, we revoked that token. But I, I think that uh, in the current 
state of play where, where there is always a human in the loop that has to do the revocation. If you have reasonably short-lived tokens, it doesn't really make sense to, um, to, to, um, to revoke a token because that token will have <laughs> expired before you, you, you can revoke it. In, in, in a possible future where um, IDSs will be very capable, um, will be very, um, very sensitive, they may be able to um, detect uh, attacks, uh, they may be able to, to detect breaches of, uh, of, of tokens, um, and they may then be able to automatically revoke tokens, but we're certainly not there. Um, and then, obviously, there is the, the question of uh, theft. Uh, so the OpenID Connect tokens, the OAuth tokens that are J, uh, JOT without uh, proof of possession, uh, they, they, are certainly, um, they, they are certainly vulnerable to theft. And that's, that, that, that's a real problem that you, have to, um, that you have to deal with. You always have to use them over TLS, for example. Yeah, Jim. Possession tokens are highly vulnerable to theft. I can do replay attacks with them, even though I might, be not, I might not be able to. Um, all I'm saying is some service provides uh, a signed token with a jot inside of it, right? Mm -hmm. If I can get my paws on that, I might not be able to modify it, but I can always replay it up, up the pipe if there's not a good authenticated, uh, if there's not a good um, established secure transport between those two entities. So again, even though even with proof of, even with proof of possession in play, replay is still a potential problem. Yeah, um, it's it's not entirely clear to me how uh, proof of possession tokens will be used. Let me uh, move to to this. Um, so proof of possession. Um, Hang on. Yeah, let, let's, start, let's start with that. Uh, so in proof of possession, what, what happens is that, uh, uh, and, and this is the flow in case you use asymmetric crypto, right? Uh, there is a similar one uh, for symmetric uh, crypto. That's, that's figure one in the, in the standard. Um, in figure two, they, they show you uh, with asymmetric crypto. And, and what you do there is you, you send your public key to the issuer, and the issuer sends it back in the token, um, and the token is integrity protected with a signature by the, um, uh, by the issuer. Um, and the presenter then sends it to the recipient, um, so the JOT, including the public, the public key. And what happens then with that, with that public key? Um, there are various scenarios according to the standard. Um, one is the simplest one, the, conceptually the simplest one, is that um, the recipient is going to send out a challenge, uh, send out a, a nonce, um, and the uh, presenter is going to sign the nonce with a private key. Right? That, that, that's, that's straightforward. So Another tying, possibility... You're tying the token to the current transport to the current mutual TLS or TLS transport, so it can't be used out of that trans out of that specific transport session. Right. Yes. So, so awesome. that, that that's that's what would happen. Um, so, but yeah, you 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 mentioned uh, the TLS. So, what this seems to be suggesting um, is that the uh, you you set up a mutually authenticated TLS session where you use the um, key pair generated by the presenter. The, the, the presenter uses the, the, the key pair um, as the basis for, for its certificate. Which is not vulnerable to replay. So if I steal your token and I try to use it in my own connection with, it's not going to work because this is tied specifically to, the, to, the, to the, those ephemeral keys within your TLS exchange. I'm, I'm not sure what to think because um, it's, it's basically talking about setting up a connection, a trusted connection. Um, 
And that seems to me to be much, well, add a number of uh, complications that you don't have if you have a simple binding between the token and the call. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm not entirely sure what to think, um, but anyway, uh, I have time to make up my mind because um, you know the the technology is not available today, um, not in a practical sense. Um, if you know of any um, of any vendors of any. Uh, uh, projects that do um, implement proof of possession tokens, please tell me. I, I'm, I'm very interested. Um, so, Jot, uh, how much time do I still have? When does this session finish? Uh, Sorry? It's already over. <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Let's skip this. Um, I'm going. So what I'm pleading for is that we um, we're using um, jots as access tokens. Uh, this is the pattern I envisage uh, for fine-grained authorization. Um, so basically, you propagate the the token um, to um, your various REST services. Here um, we, we have the authorization happening on in each uh, REST service as well. I think that Merlene and, and Jim will be happier here. Um, demo, I'm sorry, uh, I don't have the time. Um, I would have liked to have gone through uh, a little mental threat modeling here, but um, don't have time. The uh, point about authenticating the, the client. So um, this, this is being done currently in a very rudimentary fashion. Uh, I mean, very often what, what happens is that the um, client is being issued with an API key um, and this is uh, uh, just transported with a call um, and uh, um, this leads to insecurities, of course. Um, this this pattern is going to change obviously uh, when when we have proof of possession tokens then then you can you you are indeed binding the um, sender to um, are, there, uh, are there any other techniques to do that I mean it seems to me that everyone is using just API keys but it seems an obvious insecurity there yeah yeah I I don't really see anything on the horizon except for proof of possession tokens. Um, again, if if you know of any other alternatives, please please let me know. I'd be interested. Um, I'm going to have to skip the uh, bit on my wish list uh, about uh, externalizing the uh, uh, the PDP or so the authorization um, uh, decision. Um, I meant to say that we could also, perhaps we should also be using, uh, be, be authenticating the user agent because after all, they're also in uh, our TCB if we if we building these kind of uh, applications. Uh, but I, I don't really have a good view on, on, on how to do that. Um, so that's all we have time for. Um, very, very briefly, um, 
do you think that these principles make sense? Do you think that this wish list is, is the right one? Um, Jim? I think if you're doing social media level threat models, the current state of the, uh, the current state of bear tokens is acceptable. I think if you're doing finance or government where security is more critical, then we should avoid these standards and move into more proof of possession, or, or just move into the proof of possession, RFC 7800. We see a lot of the, um, uh, these identity providers start to support it as of about six months ago. I, I sent you some links on that. But really understand your threat model. The OAuth and OIDC was not meant for banking and government. It was mm. meant for social media. And now people are ramming it into high-risk situations. So mm. if you're going to use these texts in a higher situation, you have got to bring rigorous cryptography back into this with, with proof of possession, which is key management and challenging, but necessary for banking. That's kind of my summary of these technologies. Do you, do you buy that at all? Do you, do you back that at all? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair statement. I, I think, I mean, from a authenticating user's point of view, there are some technologies like OIS and stuff like that. I think the, the, the biggest problem is inter-service authentication and, yeah. and application to service authentication. Yeah. Um, the same thing that I said before, using API tokens seems like a, a API safe keys. Uh, it, idea. I mean, the thing is that if you steal one API token, you can start calling the, the REST service and then you have the same next level of the application itself. And then, I don't know. Yeah. It is some kind of identification of the REST, uh, the REST API itself, but it's, it seems insufficient. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I agree. I agree. Any other comments? Okay. Well, enjoy your coffee. <laughs>